Are y'all ready to celebrate a few things this morning? All right, man, we're going to get some life going in here and get excited about what God is doing. We're going to wrap up our series today on um, uh, Let There Be Light, Plug Into God's Plan for Salvation. And I know we've been going through the, cir- the, uh, the three circles in our small group. I want to give you some praises about some people that have gotten saved and just take a few minutes to celebrate together here this morning. I don't know if you notice our wall over there, but it is filling up. And uh, I want to tell you about a young man that just started coming to our church in January. He's one of our interns. He's a pastoral ministries major at Pensacola Christian College. His name is Chris Carlson. And uh, he's got excited about the three circles. And he noticed a young man on his floor the other night reading the Bible. And so he goes up to him. They strike up a conversation, which turns into a gospel conversation. And he had the opportunity to go through the three circles with him. And that young man named Eric trusted the Lord as his savior, as a college student, at a Christian college. Not even everybody there is saved, okay? So would you praise the Lord about that, man? That is awesome. So one of our light bulbs represents that. Um, Diane, who's sitting right up here in the front. Diane, wave hi to everybody. You all know Diane. Diane greets you every Sunday morning with a big, huge smile on her face. She is filled with the Spirit. She's been a joy and a blessing to me personally ever since she has shown up here. Well, she had a neighbor named Joy, who um, she's been burdened about for a long time. Joy had been sick for months and uh, had some of the early stages of um, dementia and Alzheimer's. And God just burdened her heart about going over there and sharing the gospel with her. Joy believed in God but did not have a personal relationship with the Lord. And on February 1st, Joy put her faith and trust in Jesus and got saved. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? Now, here's the amazing thing and sobering thing about that. On February 2nd, Joy passed away. And she went into the presence of her Lord and Savior, now, I know I've talked to several of you that have burdens for, for family members, people, maybe neighbors, just people that are, are older. Several of you have even come to me and asked me questions along the way, like, how can I be a witness? How can I share the gospel with somebody? Listen, it is never too late to trust Jesus. It's never too late to share the gospel of Jesus. And her and her husband, Gary, I believe his name is, have been married for 62 years. And as a result of what happened in Joy's life, I know Diane also reached out to another pastor that lives close to where they're at, and he came over, and Gary also rededicated his life to the Lord and got his life right with Jesus. So will you praise the Lord again for stories like that and what God is doing? You got one? You, got, you want one more? You want another one? We have a young uh, teenage girl. Her name's Brooke. She's been a part of our church and coming here for a long time. She said this, everybody in her life is a Christian, so she just always has assumed that she's a Christian. But as a result of coming to our school, sitting in chapel services, she just recently realized that, oh man, this is a personal decision. I'm not saved just because everybody around me saved or because my family saved. I have to personally put my faith and trust in Jesus. So you know what she did? She asked her friend, Andy Kunkelman, who's just also a seventh grade boy. And Andy, right before youth group, just a week or so ago, led her to the Lord and all of her friends were praying and excited. And that's happening right here in our youth group, in our middle school. And so will you praise the Lord and rejoice in that this morning? There is nothing more important, there's nothing more exciting than when somebody goes from death to life by putting their faith and trust in Jesus and what he's done for them on the cross. And so I just wanna celebrate and I just want to encourage you, if you've been feeling that burden, continue to feel that burden. Never let that burden go away. There is a world that is lost and they're waiting for somebody. There are people that are literally waiting. They're lost because they don't know. And that's our job is to share the truth of Jesus Christ with others. So continue to be burdened, continue to be praying. Wouldn't it be awesome to see every single spot on that thing? I'd love to see that thing so bright one day. We don't even have to turn the rest of the lights on. We can just let that thing light it up. All right. So no, seriously, that would be incredible if we could continue to do that. And already God, God's done exceeding abundantly above anything that I could have ever asked or thought already this year. And I'm just excited about next week's baptism Sunday and just rejoicing with some of the other people that have gotten saved. So praise the Lord for his goodness and his grace. Now that leads me to our message this morning, which is simply called the results of salvation. Okay. We are Coming to the conclusion of Romans 9 through 11, and in Romans chapters 9 through 11, Paul has been defending the faithfulness of God to the nation of Israel. Here's the reason why. Israel, 
God's chosen people, they rejected Christ. He sent his only son. He sent the Messiah that they had been longing for and waiting for, and they rejected him, and they were complicit in his death. They were crying out, crucify him, crucify him, and Jesus died, and he was buried. But on the third day, we know what happened. He rose again from the grave. And you know what's even more amazing? That after he rose again from the grave, just three days later, who was the gospel preached to first? The very people that were responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. In spite of the fact that they killed God's son, he still is extending his grace and his mercy. And he's saying, okay, y'all messed up, but it's okay. He died for your sins. Repent and believe. And they still rejected their Messiah. And as a result of that, it appears as if God has forsaken Israel. It appears as if he's set them aside for forever. And Paul's saying, yes, they're cut off for a time and they're separated. And and the vehicle for the gospel is now going to be through the church, through us. But make no mistake about it. God has always been and always will be faithful to keep his promises. And so here he is on the conclusion of his argument. And he's going and he's speaking directly to the Gentiles. So he's speaking directly to us. All right, and this is his concluding remarks, and he's going to talk to us about what God is doing in the big picture, the big scheme of things, what he's been doing behind the scenes in this matter of salvation, and we're going to find some incredible results that come from his awesome plan for salvation. So are you all ready to dive right in this morning? Okay, wow, that was not very convincing. (laughs) Do we need to start over again? Let's go back to the beginning and rejoin. No, just kidding. All right, are y'all ready to dive right in this morning? Uh, There we go. All right, the first thing that I want us to see, the first result of salvation is this, envy. Envy. Look at verse 13 of Proverbs, I mean, Romans chapter 11, verse 13. It says, for I speak to you Gentiles... Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Now, before we just go on, I just got to stop and say, wow, there are statements in the Bible that we just can't read and brush over. Paul is saying that his office is the apostle to the Gentiles, and he's magnifying his office. He's making a big deal of his office. If you know anything about Paul in the Bible, before he was Paul, does anybody remember what his name was? Saul, y'all are good. Okay, I got everybody with me. Saul. Saul was one of the greatest persecutors of the Christians in the early days. Saul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, he was as devout as a religious Jewish person as you would ever find. And he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, God's son. And as a result of that, he was a persecutor of the early Christians. So not uh, not only would Paul not want his Jewish countrymen to be saved and put their faith and trust in Jesus, there is no way on earth that he would ever want the Gentile dogs, as they refer to them, to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. You want to talk about the transformation of the gospel? (laughs) Here Paul is magnifying his office. He's making a big deal of the fact that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. All of the other disciples of Jesus that became the apostles of Jesus, they preached primarily to the Jewish people. Paul's job was to preach primarily to the Gentile people and to introduce the gospel of Christ to them. So this is how it's all working. Now look what he says in verse 14. The reason why he's making such a big deal about this, he says this, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. The reason he is magnifying his office is because of that word emulation. You know what that word emulation means there? It means to make jealous. Paul's magnifying his office. He's magnifying his testimony. He's making a big deal of it because his desire is to make his fellow countrymen, his brothers and sisters, is to provoke them to jealousy so that way they may get saved. Now, the first result of salvation is envy. Now, is envy a good result of salvation? What do you think? How many of you say, yes, envy is a good result of salvation? How many of you say, no, that doesn't sound right? How many of you are just flat out undecided and you're like, I came here today so you would teach me? (laughs) Okay. Man, you can't always do that, though. You got to sometimes dive in for yourselves. All right. So listen, the word envy, okay? Envy is the desire to have for yourself 
Something that is possessed by somebody else. Y'all get that, okay? Envy is when you look at somebody else, they got something that you want and you really have a desire to have it. Now, whether envy is good or whether envy is evil depends on the nature of what is being desired. So do you understand that? Whether envy is good or whether it's evil depends on the nature of what is being desired. So let me ask you again, Envy in regards to salvation, people being envious of what you have, what I have, what the apostle Paul has, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Now, how many of you believe that that's a good thing? Say amen. Amen. It's a good thing. That's what Paul's saying. I, I want my fellow countrymen to be envious of what I have because I have something amazing. I have Christ. I have that treasure that Hamish was talking about that's been buried in the field. And I have all of the riches that come along with knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And so you know what the first practical application is from this? Be the envy of the world. Be the envy of the world. You and I are a part of something that is huge and eternal. All right, does anybody know what is happening later today? There's a, there might be a certain event that's happening later. Anybody know what it is that's happening today? I'm surprised you actually know that, Scarlett. Okay. She's in a house full of brothers. So the Super Bowl is happening later today. Something huge. It's taking place. I mean, a, a, the world pays attention to the Super Bowl. There's some really cool storylines that are happening in the game today. You got Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes has his chance to win his third Super Bowl. If he wins this Super Bowl today, he's going to begin to really start coming up in the conversations of the greatest of all times. He's going to start getting mentioned in there with the names and the likes of Tom Brady and Joe Montana and some of the greatest quarterbacks. I mean, Patrick Mahomes has got a lot at stake here winning another Super Bowl today. You also, on the other side, for the San Francisco 49ers, you have a quarterback by the name of Brock Purdy. How many of you like an, okay. I saw a lot of really ugly faces in here too when I'm talking about Patrick Mahomes. So I think I know where, where you're going. Brock Purdy, you know, what his, you know what he's called? Mr. Irrelevant. Do you know why he's called Mr. Irrelevant? He was the very last pick of the 2022 draft. Patrick Mahomes is making over $40 million a year. This year, um, Brock Purdy is only scheduled to make $850,000. He is like signed a four-year contract. He's a broke man, the last pick in the end. He's so poor, so poor (laughs) at $850,000 that he's had to live with his offensive lineman roommate to save money. I mean, I don't, I wish I had those poor problems, but anyway, I mean, you got the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Nobody knew who this guy was. Nobody thought he would show up. And here he was an MVP caliber candidate, man. He's got a chance to cement himself in the Lord. I mean, they will, if he wins the Super Bowl today, they will tell the stories, the underdog story, Brock Purdy, the nobody, the last pick in the draft comes in and proves all the naysayers wrong. I mean, he's got a legacy that could be talked about for years that's at stake today. I mean, there's some big things happening and taking place. Can I tell all of us here this morning, you and I are a part of something greater, far more important that actually has eternal significance because people are going to forget about Brock Purdy and Patrick Mahomes one day, but they will never forget about Jesus Christ and what he is doing in and through his people. Now, let me prove that to you. I'm not just saying that. Look at verse 15. He says this, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Paul's talking about the Jewish people. If they're casting away, be the reconciling of the world. Do you understand when they rejected Jesus and now when the gospel has been offered to the Gentiles, to us, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that is the reconciling of the world. And when those believers got saved, guess what happened? The church of God was born. And can I tell you, the church is awesome. The church is magnificent. I know the church catches a lot of shade in this world today. And in some ways, understandably and deservedly slow, uh, deservedly so. We're sinners, we're not perfect people, and there have been a lot of churches that haven't necessarily loved others the way that God intends them to. There's been a lot of hypocrisy, things like that, but make no mistake about it. The church is awesome. God loved the church. 
He gave his son to die. He gave his life for the church. All around this community today, the gospel of Jesus is being lifted on high. You know, we support over 60 missionaries all around the world for the past 24 hours, throughout the entire day, all through the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached and people are being saved and lives are being transformed. And there might not be physical light bulbs that are lighting up, but there is rejoicing in heaven because God is reconciling the world to him and he's using us as the church to be the vehicle that he does. And you know what he says in that? Man, if that's not awesome enough in and of itself, he says, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Imagine this. One day the Jewish people, and I'm going to say more about this at the end, are going to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And imagine how incredible and awesome and great that is going to be when the Gentiles and the Jewish people and God's family, the world unites together in faith in Jesus Christ. You understand? We're a part of something that is huge and has eternal significance. Can I also tell you this morning, you can't lose. Look at the next verse. Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. The first fruits, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those are the people that he made his promises to. And they were holy because they believed God. They weren't holy because they were great people. They're humans just like us. They were holy because they believed God and his word. And if the first fruits were holy, then are the lump and then is the root and so are the branches. There is still a remnant of believers today inside the true nation of Israel that God has been faithful to and God is never gonna abandon his people. And what does that mean for you and I today? It just simply means that if God's faithful to his people, Israel, even in their stubbornness and in their rejection, make no mistake about it. He is going to be faithful to you. And all the incredible promises we talked about in Romans chapter 8 are going to be true in your life because God is faithful. You can't lose. We're on the winning side. You understand that? We have a God that has unconditional love that flows towards us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. So live with confidence. Man, you're a part of something big, bigger than the Super Bowl, bigger than anything that the world has to show you. You can't lose. And you have the treasure. You have Christ. Man, there's another person that's going to be at the Super Bowl today. Her name is Taylor. What's her last name? I can forget it, man. What is it? No. I, I, I feel bad as a true football fan even, met, but I'm not throwing shade on her at all, okay? She can't help who she falls in love with, whatever. That's beside the point. The reason why I mention it is just one interesting sideline to this whole story is that I read that there is no more room for any of the billionaires' private jets in the airports in Las Vegas. They are all filled. And here's what I'm trying. There's nobody that knows how to throw a party better than the city of Las Vegas. And everybody... That's, that, that means somebody is showing up. The world, again, is paying attention. But can I tell you this this morning? Behind all of the glitz and glamour that you're going to see throughout the day today, on your social media feeds throughout this week, behind all of that glitz and glamour is the same brokenness, is the same mortality. Death's coming for Everybody. No amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of success, no amount of fortune is ever going to be able to get in the way and stop that. Behind all of that is the same exact need that you and I have. And do you understand what you have if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus? You have Christ. You have the treasure. You have everything that the world is looking for. Can I tell all of you this morning, be the envy of the world to you, single, uh, to you young people, you teenagers. You already have Christ. You already have the greatest secret that the whole world is looking for. Embrace Jesus. Recognize that he's the treasure that you're looking for. Put him first. Pursue him. You can't go wrong in life. Man, if you're single, you know what? You already have the greatest, most perfect relationship in all of the world. So lean into Christ and let him satisfy you and fulfill you. To all of you married people in here, do you know what? Through our love, we get to show the world Christ and his magnificent love for them. So fall in love with Jesus and fall more in love with your spouse and let his light shine in your life. Hey, to those of you that are hurting and going through pain and suffering in your weakness, he is made strong. If you've suffered long, 
boss, guess what? He's a, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. All I'm trying to say in every single area of your life, you have what you need. You have what the world is looking for. So live like it. Be the envy of the world. Live with joy. Live with confidence. Live with exciting, live, excitement. Live with purpose because of who you are in Christ. So envy, it's a wonderful result of salvation. Secondly, I want you to see not only is envy a result of salvation, but humility is. Humility. Look at verse 17. Just in case we start getting puffed up with pride because of who and what we have in Christ, which, by the way, ought to thrill our hearts and thrill our souls. Let's talk about humility here. Look at verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. Now, I brought an illustration with me this morning. I did not bring an olive tree. I brought a blueberry bush, okay? And the reason why I brought a blueberry bush is because this resonates with me. It means something to me, okay? Because when we lived in our first house over on Bostick Lane, our neighbor was an older lady. I took care of her yard, and in her yard, she had about five or six blueberries that produced really good and amazing blueberries. And we got to have full access to those blueberries. And so while we lived there, man, we ate them, we froze them. We enjoyed the fruit of those blueberries all year long to the point that when we moved to our new house, one of the things, man, we needed this many bedrooms, this many bathrooms, and we needed blueberry bushes, okay? It just was a nice little extra touch if they were there. Well, you'll imagine my excitement when I found out that on the property that we moved to, on Scooter Lane, what a Milton name right there, I love it, okay. <laughs> on Scooter Lane, we didn't just have one, two, or three blueberry bushes, we have dozens of blueberry bushes on our property. Man, I was so excited when I found out about this. We moved in June. I was like, June is when the blueberries are coming in. I couldn't wait to get over there. And I went out, I got my bucket and my pail, and I'm ready to go reap the rewards from my blueberries. And I go out and I look, and there's barely any blueberries on the tree. And if there were, they were tiny and small, because you know what I had? I had wild blueberry bushes. And I was like, well, maybe if I prune these things and fertilize them. And I went to a gardener in our church at that time, and he said, don't prune, don't fertilize. It's not going to matter. Go buy a good blueberry bush, one at Lowe's, plant it in your grass, water and fertilize that. You will get the blueberries that you want. So I brought blueberry bushes because I cut these from my yard. See, this is a wild blueberry bush right here. And you can see it's blooming. But how many of you agree this one looks like it's blooming a little bit differently than this one is blooming right here? All right, so this is the good blueberry bush. This is a wild blueberry bush. I'm going to set this to the side for a minute. You know what the Bible's telling us? Because the Jews rejected the Messiah, because they rejected the gospel, he comes along and he cuts them off. Even though they were naturally born a Jew, that's not what saves you. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ is what saves you. And so the natural branches are cut off. And the reason that they're cut off, and some of you are like, you're murdering this blueberry bush up here. Listen, the reason why they are cut off is so that these wild blueberry bushes then could in turn be grafted in. Now, if you talk to somebody that's like a a real gardener and knows what they're talking about in these areas, how do you graft a wild blueberry bush into a good blueberry bush. All I can say at the end of the day, you know what it is? It is a pure miracle of God. And God can take these wild blueberry branches, which by the way, they're us. And before we know Jesus Christ as our savior, that's pretty much what we look like right there, okay? (laughs) Nice and skinny, not a whole lot of fruit right here. But man, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and we get grafted into the root and the good branch, all of a sudden we can begin to produce fruit that the world can be envious of, that the world would want to taste and see what it is that we're talking about. Now, here's the practical application from all of this. Boast not. Boast not. Look at where he goes in verse 18. Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast... Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. He said, if you're boasting, what are you boasting about? You don't, you're not holding up the root. The root is holding you up, okay? So we got nothing to boast about. It's not our strength that saved us. It's not our power. We are being upheld by the root. That's where we get our sustainment from. That's where we get our life from, not from ourselves. So don't boast. 
Then look what he says in verse 19. Thou wilt say then, well, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I mean, we might sit here and start getting prideful and saying, hey, those people, they rejected Jesus and they got cut off. And now that makes room for us to be able to get grafted in. And he's saying, listen, he says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. The only reason why these good branches were broken off was because they failed to believe in Jesus Christ. They failed to believe in the Messiah. That's what salvation has always been by faith and faith alone. And the only reason why we're able to stand in the good bush and produce fruit is because of our faith, not in ourselves, but in the fact that we recognize we're broken sinners. There's nothing good about us. It's only because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross that we can be saved. And when we believe and we say, man, I'm broken and I'm a mess and I want to be a part of that bush. Man, I want to be God's child. I want to be a part of his family. And you believe that Jesus died so that he could reconcile you, reconcile you and buy you back to him. Then all of a sudden you now get grafted in, but you stand there by faith and faith alone. It has nothing to do with you or me or anything that we could ever do. Now look where he goes at the end of verse 20. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also not spare thee. I want you to fill in some blanks with me in verse 22. Behold, therefore, the what? End of God. On them which fell, but toward thee, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, what's that last phrase? Thou also shall be cut off. You know what he's saying here? Boast not. Boast not. Now, the point here is not that if you sin and if you mess up that you can lose your salvation. That, that's not the point of what he's talking about here. You're saved by faith. Salvation has nothing to do with you. Therefore, there's nothing that you can do to ever lose your salvation. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus and you're standing by faith and faith alone, make no mistake about it. You are saved and secure to God be the glory. But what he wants us to understand is that God is serious about this matter of salvation. He's not playing around. The world needs Jesus. The greatest gift in all the world that God could give us is himself. And without him, we are broken and we are miserable and we are a mess. Just look around you at the world today. It is broken. It is miserable. People are longing for unity. They're looking for a savior. They don't recognize that it's Jesus. But the only thing that we need, the only so the way that our problems can be solved is if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And that's why unbelief is severe. It ought to catch our attention. You know, these branches that are, are cut off, you know where they're going to go? They're going to go into the fire. There's other parts in the scripture that talk about that, where they're going to be burned up. God's not playing around. God also wants to incredibly bless your life. Behold the goodness and severity of God. And all he's trying to tell us is to stay humble. You got saved through your humility of recognizing that you need a savior. So live in humility. Don't get puffed up with pride. Don't start thinking that you're better than the rest of the world around you. Stay on your face before God and behold his goodness and walk in his goodness and live in his goodness. And if you do that, make no mistake about it. God is serious about pouring out his goodness and his blessings on your life. But if you want to just take it for granted and be ho-hum about salvation and Christ, and yeah, I'm glad that I'm saved, and I'm glad that I know I'm going to heaven, but you don't really want to dive into God's word and pursue Christ as your treasure, he's not going to bless you. He's not going to pour out his blessings in your life in a way that's going to make you the envy of the world. That happens when we continue in his goodness. And just know this, God's not playing around at all. We don't need to be playing around. We need to be humble and recognize that we are a part of something that has eternal weight, eternal significance. And we're going to stand before God one day. The next thing that I want you to see is mercy, the results of salvation, envy, humility, mercy. Look at God's mercy to Israel. Look at the um, next verse, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Again, Paul's reiterating the fact. He's saying, listen, do not become prideful. I want you to understand the mystery that is no longer a mystery. All right, that's what he's saying. By the way, this, this was huge. Throughout the Old Testament, even the angels didn't fully understand what God was doing. Now it's being revealed on a world stage and it's still being revealed today. And he's writing this, and you have to put yourself here in this time and in this place. Do you think the Gentiles had any favorable thoughts to the Jewish people? And the answer to that question is no. Number one, they were despised by the Jewish people. Number two, in every city that you go throughout the New Testament, you know where Paul would start? Paul would start in the synagogue. He would start with the Jewish people. The Jewish people would then reject Christ and the Messiah. He would go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would get saved. The Jewish people would begin to persecute. So you can understand that there would probably be some very serious, strong feelings of animosity and resentment towards the Jewish people. And Paul's saying, listen to me. Do not get prideful. Do not look at them as your enemies. Don't do that. That would be wrong. He's saying right now, their rejection, their blindness is only in part. It's only for a time. And the reason that they're blind is so that you can get saved and so that the gospel could come to you. And what he's reminding us of all the fact is that we owe our salvation to the Jewish people. They're God's chosen people. And it was through them that his Messiah entered the world. And it's through them we get grafted into the true Israel when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And so he's saying, don't get filled up with pride. Don't get puffed up. Don't become hateful towards those, them. They are God's chosen people still. And you need to love them. And you need to pray for their salvation. And to this day, listen, we're separated from that. We're not being persecuted, but they are still God's chosen people. And we ought to pray for their salvation. And we ought to love them. And we ought to care about them. And by the way, God's doing something incredible through them that shows this world who he is still. I mean, it's amazing. I don't have time to get into all of that, but it's amazing what God's doing. So look at what he says in verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. What he's saying is all Israel is going to be saved. Now, not every single person of Israel, but Israel as a whole. There's going to be a day and a time where Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people as a whole, are going to repent and believe, and the deliverer is going to show up, and he's going to save them, and he's going to take away their sins, just like he did when we put our faith and trust in him. That's going to be a revival unlike what the world has ever seen before. What an awesome day that that's going to be. And then look what he says in verse, the next verse. Verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Is God faithful to his people? Oh, yeah. For the enemies, for the gospel, they are your enemies for the gospel's sake. They feel like your enemies right now because they are persecuting you. But listen. They are the elect of God. They are his chosen people. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Once God God makes an unconditional covenant, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how far you go. It doesn't matter if you want nothing to do with him. He still loves you and cares about you, and he will fulfill his promises down to the very end because our God is an amazing and merciful God. So look at how this all ends, okay? Look at verses 30 and 31 through 32. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have, what's that word? Mercy upon all. I'm going to start in verse 32. You know what that word conclude, for God has concluded them all in unbelief? That word conclude means to shut up. God has shut them up. He's locked them up. He's put them in a situation where there is absolutely no room for escape. And in verses 30 and 31, he gave us the big broad picture of what has been happening through his plan of salvation up to this point in the world today. So I'm going to illustrate this for you. I need a Jew and I need a Gentile. So Joash and Justice, you might as mind coming up here and helping me out. Sorry. Give them a warm round of applause and welcome as they come to the stage. 
justice, you're the younger brother. I'm going to make you the Gentile. Actually, you should be the Jew. You're the Jew. You're not locked up, okay? You are going to get locked up. Okay. Just pretend that Joe Ashier is in jail. He's locked up. There's no way he's getting out of them. He doesn't have the key. He is locked up. Okay, so here are, in verses 30 and 31, you can go back and look at this closer later. There's four stages of how he's worked in this world through the gospel. The first one was this, the time of Gentile disobedience. Okay, so he's a Gentile. He's locked up. And you know what God was doing all through the Old Testament period? He was patiently, lovingly working through the Jewish nation, through his people. Man, he gave us his laws. He showed us thousands of years of history of what mercy looks like and what long suffering looks like and what love looks like, calling his people back to him over and over again. And we have an entire Old Testament that is rich in who God is and how wonderful and great he is. And while that was all going on, the Gentiles are just over here in their disobedience. They're just living their best life. They're, they're not ignorant of God because the heavens declare the glory of God, but they're not interested in God and they're not repenting necessarily. The Gentiles as a whole are not repenting and they're not getting saved. Well, then you get to the next phase of history, which is the Jewish people's disobedience. It was never about the fact that you're born a Jew that makes you saved. It was always about faith in Jesus. It was always about a relationship. It wasn't about the sacrifices. It wasn't about religion. It wasn't about going to church, reading your Bible, giving the money. It's about believing in Jesus and having a relationship with him. And they didn't want that. And Jesus came himself and they rejected him. They didn't believe that God himself was right in front of them. And so they rejected them. And guess what? God has concluded them in unbelief. It's another way of saying, man, they're locked up. You know what? In the Bible, there's two main groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. And guess what that covers? The entire world. And guess what God has concluded? Everybody's in unbelief. That's where we all come from. That's where we all start. But when the Jew, who's the Jew? You. Okay, sorry. It's one of those mornings, man. Okay. When the Jewish people got locked up, the gospel now comes over here to the Gentiles and, and it's like we go to Joash here and we're like, listen, you're broken. And they're like, yeah, we are, man. This world's messed up. You need a savior. There's a God. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. All you got to do is put your faith in him. Believe that you're a sinner. Believe there's nothing you can do to save yourself. You're locked up and you know you're locked up. Man, you got a mortal soul. You're going to die one day. What happens then? You think you don't need God now? Hey, when you find yourself about to breathe your last breath, you're going to be wondering really hard, is God real or is he not real? We all have a mortal, never-to-die soul, and we are bound in our mortality, and there's absolutely nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing you can do to escape it. It's only through the gift of Jesus Christ, and he says, man, I want Jesus, and you know what Jesus does? Jesus comes and hopefully sets him free. Now listen, will you praise the Lord? Listen, when you got saved, the chains of your sin, the chains of your past, get that thing out. <laughs> Maybe I'm turning, there, I turned it the wrong way. They drop and you're set free. Will you praise the Lord for that this morning? <laughs> now, man, now he's, he's us. He's the one that's the envy of the world. He's been set free. You understand what I'm talking about? He's got something to celebrate and rejoice. What should be the most natural thing that he does? Run and proclaim it to the world. Live your best life. You found the treasure. You got eternal life. You are victorious. You got the riches of Christ. Nothing and no one is ever, ever, ever going to take that away from you. To God be the glory. And the reason why God's done that is so that his chosen people over here are looking around at us as the church. They're saying, why, why are people witnessing to us telling us about Jesus? What, what, what's God doing through this church? And you know what the Bible's telling us here? There is going to come a day when the Jewish people look on the Gentiles, they look on us, and they're going to see Jesus, and they're going to repent, and they're going to believe. And guess what's going to happen, man? God's going to come along, and there we go. He's going to come along, and when they believe, they're going to go from death to life. They're going to go from bondage to freedom. And look at this picture right here. And you know what's going to happen? Give each other a big hug, boys. <laughs> Jews and Gentiles, look at this. This is what God's headed towards. It's going to all be one one day. 
He used the Jews to get our attention. He's now using us to get the Jews' attention because God is a God who loves the world. And God is a God who's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. And that doesn't mean that all will. You've got to believe and you've got to trust. And I want to tell you this morning, go ahead, you guys can be seated. Give them a thank you as they head back to their seats. Never forget. What's the results of salvation? The mercy of God. We were concluded in unbelief. We were locked up, chained. We had absolutely no hope and no way out. And then Jesus came. Never forget. Never forget who you are. Never forget what he saved you from. Never forget what he wants to do in your life. Stay humble. Stay at the foot of the cross. Pursue Christ as your treasure and watch him pour out the goodness of God in your life and stay as far away from that severity as you possibly can. And you know what? Live free. Live free. Stand up and testify. Tell the world you're a child of God. You got something to be proud of. You got the good news of Jesus Christ. You got something better than winning a Super Bowl championship. You got a better underdog story than Brock Purdy. You have Jesus. You had no hope, but now you have life and you have eternal life and you have something to take to this world. That's what God's plan of salvation is all about. Don't be prideful. Don't think you're better than everybody else. Get a burden for those that aren't here today. Get a burden for your neighbors. Get a burden for those that are broken. Get a burden for your enemies that are persecuting you and making your life difficult. They just don't have Jesus and you do. And love, love the way that Christ loves. And the last result is worship. We all stand to your feet as we close our service this morning. And I want you to put verses 33 through 36 back up on the screen. The results of salvation, envy, humility, mercy, and you know what this all should result in? I mean, are you blown away by God's master plan and how he's been moving and working and what he's been doing in this world? What should that bring about in our hearts and in our lives? Let's all read these verses out loud together. They, they speak for themselves. And I wanna challenge you, go home and meditate on these this afternoon. Meditate on these this week. Think about who you were and who you are now in Christ. Let the gospel, let the word of God speak for itself. Ready, let's read. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Hey, the altar's open. Will, will you come and will you bow before your Lord and Savior this morning? Will you worship? So now I'm going to be quiet. I'm, I Seriously, I want you just to take this minute and worship and bow. Let God speak to your heart. Maybe you just need to be humbled again by his amazing grace. Maybe you just need to get excited about who, who Christ is and him being the treasure of your life. Will you bow before God? Will you tell him thank you? Will you ask him to light a fire in your heart that nobody can put out?